Good morning, Dr. Saab. This is Vishal Kapoor, uh, PK's associate. He's stuck in some work, so good morning from New York and good morning from New York Endovascular Club. Thank you for agreeing for the case good morning. and let's see what we have. Good morning, Vishal. Thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us and having us. Uh, uh, I'm privileged today uh, to uh, be presenting this uh, uh, case. I want to first introduce uh, our uh, uh, staff members that uh, came on a Saturday, um, and they were all gracious enough to help us in this case. Uh, to my right, come here, Stan. Stan is uh, our, uh, our uh, 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 RT tech uh, support uh, today. Behind me is uh, uh, Abigail Mice. She's our interventional ultrasonographer um, and our research coordinator. Uh, to the corner there is Lisa, uh, nursing support. And to the other corner, Abby, our nursing support, and the team with the with the imaging. Uh, behind me is our uh, lead tech, uh, uh, Nate Sheridan, who's uh, be recording for this case. So we have a very interesting case uh, for you today. Can I have the next slide, please? This is a 69-year-old gentleman. Uh, he's a Rutherford class five with a wound at an amputation site of a great toe. He has a typical risk factors. Um, uh, that you see with the CLI patients with coronary artery disease, CKD, and diabetes. Uh, patient uh, uh, has a long-standing history of uh, PAD disease, and uh, just two weeks ago underwent uh, SFA popliteal, TPT, and perineal revascularization, uh, uh, revascularization at the time, and he was staged for uh, uh, angiosome directed therapy today, which is not uncommon with patients with multi-level disease, uh, CLI patients, uh, that uh, all of us see in our population, in our patient population. Uh, next slide, please. I want to show you the images of uh, the last intervention. Those are kind of the post-intervention images uh, that you can see. I apologize, we don't have a picture of the wound, but I will show you once we go live um, of where is the wound distribution. But you can see this is the SFA, uh, popliteal, uh, kind of TPT perineal. And you can see to the right, the final image, this is an image that was obtained through a sheath uh, of the pedal loop uh, uh, there and the plantar circulation there. So what we did today uh, is um, we obtained anti-grade access and it's our policy or our approach is to basically proceed uh, always with, um, um, let me see, I wanna show you the image. I apologize. So we, we usually uh, proceed with ultrasound guided anti-grade access for tibial interventions and pedal loop. Um, you know, I would say 99% of the time, unless there is any particular or reason that we cannot do that. Um, and we save a fluoroscopic image, but this time I did not because it's a live case. So of course, I'm not going to save it. <laughs> so this is the diagnostic image through anti-grade access. Um, you can see some areas of recoil, and uh, I know we have great uh, faculty uh, discussing things here, so I, would, I look forward to their input and uh, feedback in terms of what would they like us to do next. But uh, these are selective images, and this is uh, the takeoff of the anterior tibial artery. Maybe that's the PT or a branch of the PT. Um, and, um, and I'm going to stop here and ask our physicians what would they like us to do. All right, so yeah, we just welcome the panel again, just for your reference, we have Dr. Michael Bunty, Dr. George Croissant, Dr. Shadi Halibi, uh, Dr. Bhaskar Prashottamam, and uh, Dr. Art Lee. So uh, we'll start with the panel, all the way from the left, suggestions, tips, uh, plan of action. I would just say that um, visualization of the foot is um, really important to Art's presentation just a moment ago, so. I'd just like to see a little more imaging of the foot to, and, and see exactly where the uh, well, there, is. Well, the, the, the operator is just a mean guy and does not want to show you guys. So uh. I, wanted, uh, I, wanted someone, I wanted someone to pick on that and tell me what, uh, what they think. So I agree with you. Would you, like, would you like a selective image? Can you show the next image, please, uh, Stan? So thank you for bringing that up. So that's, that's important. But this is, this is an image with a catheter placed in the popliteal artery. Um, and play it, Stan. Um, this is an image with, with the catheter placed in the popliteal artery, uh, injecting about five cc's of contrast that are diluted. So this is the image there. What would you guys uh, like us to do? Dr. Lee. Yeah, so I totally agree with the anti-grade axis, first of all. I think that's key for these kind of interventions. Uh, at first, when I saw the perineal size and sort of the ambiguous small takeoff of the possible poster tube, I thought it might be an anomalous perineal. 
I don't think it is, but it's possible. But you know, you have the takeoff of the anterior tibia, you have a foot vessel, you know, dorsalis pedis. So, um, you know, I may go after that. With this territory, you know, it could be both anterior tibial or posterior tibial, depending on which do which is dominant, which one re reconstitutes better. Luckily, you do have reconstitution in both, but I like the dorsalis pedis probably a little bit better, and you have the origin a little bit more clear in the proximal. So personally, I would go after the anterior tibial, but it looks like he might be getting ready to stick the posterior tibial. So um, I think it just depends, you know. And then so, so, Arthur, would you like us to obtain pedal access, or would you like us to approach with CTO in an integrated fashion? Um, I mean, I think... Because I, I haven't done anything yet. I can, I can go back. Yeah. I mean, I think either is probably reasonable. I, I would want to kind of see what the dorsalis pedis and the posterior table look like under ultrasound, because again, there could be, it fills very nicely, but there could be hibernating vessels, and the size, you may not get the true uh, sense of the size from here and the calcification from this image. Uh, I typically would start from an anagrade fashion. I typically take a, put a four by 45 sheath in the pop, and I go with a CXI and a slippery wire, and I go anagrade first. Uh, but again, if I go off course, sub intimal, I go quickly to the retrograde axis. I don't dissect any further to lose vessel. Um, and typically I'm doing from both right. sides, but I think either is fine. So, so thank you, Arthur. So I don't know if you guys can see the ultrasound image. Can we show the ultrasound image, guys, please? Yeah, I think ultrasound is a very good uh, means which people usually underuse, especially in these cases. I mean, it gives you a very good idea of the flow, the calcification. Did we put it up, lumen, guys, this ultrasound image? Uh, and obviously uh, the guide, and whether it's hibernating vessel or not. Oh, there's the ultrasound. Okay. Awesome. Can you put it on the large screen, guys? We are, we are live. We can see you. Uh, uh, so so I, I, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to point out to you the image. This is our interventional ultrasonographer. What you see here is a CTO cap distally. To the left of the screen is a dorsalis pedis artery. To the right of the screen is anterior tibia artery. And you can see by angiogram the size of a dorsalis pedis artery. And you can see the nature of a CTO cap. Uh, you know, I'm going to venture that this is either a type 2 CTO based on CTOP or a type 4 CTO based on CTOP. But definitely favoring retrograde access uh, in this particular case. So because of that and because of the size and angiography, that's definitely misleading. And the size on ultrasound that's definitely favoring uh, pedal access, even though we have integrated access, we're going to start with pedal access. So that's kind of my, my approach to it. So let me show you, uh, 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 let me show you how we're going to obtain pedal access. We chose the dorsalis pedis artery because we want to recreate the pedal loop, uh, make sure that we have a good pedal loop for this patient. You're going to feel a poke, sir? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good idea to do ultrasound where it access because you can find spots which are non-calcified segments, get a, usually have a relatively less or non-traumatic access, and that can help you in the long run. George, any other thoughts on your uh, management? No, I mean, I think, uh, listen, Fadi obviously knows exactly what he's <laughs> doing, and, and I'd like to thank him for waiting till 8.05 a.m. to introduce a controversy with the angiosome-directed uh, Therapy, which I don't think necessarily is controversial, but uh, what'll be interesting here is once uh, once we get further into the case, just to see what's intact and what's not intact, because when it comes to wound healing, obviously uh, there's a big difference between what you should do when someone has an intact arch versus not. So I'm I'm interested to see how this goes. Right. No, I think that's a great point you brought up, uh, Fadi. Do, do you how much of your do you do angiosome guided therapy versus do you believe in it? Don't believe in it or Pick and choose. Uh, yeah, well, maybe I'm in the minority, but you know, I, I'm not really sure that uh, that not believing in angiosome is 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 the right terminology. It's, it's actually we're moving we're moving or toward the more advanced form of it, which is pedal loop versus uh, complete pedal loop versus incomplete pedal loop. Uh, Peter Lou for those patients, and there's a lot of a lot of data which I know I looked at the I looked at the um, agenda, and I know there's some good talks from excellent speakers about the angiosome concept. Right. So, but that is, is pretty clear that uh, you know there is something to the effect of like we need to think about where are we. Uh, delivering blood and we, we, we just simply cannot ignore it. I will tell you anecdotally based on my experience, um, it, it, it's an important concept. Sure. So uh, do you want to get access by the time we do a quick talk? Uh, because of course we would want to see how you proceed from the dorsalis periods in a retrograde fashion. So by the time you get access you and think? have your equipment in, we're going to do a quick 10 minute lecture and I guess we'll connect with you again.
We're back online and I think we caught you at a good spot because we saw that ping pong access with the vessel giving you a little bit of trouble initially, but tell us where are we right now? Yeah, so um, uh, the, the, like you mentioned, the vessel was uh, a bit challenging um, and all we did is we moved slightly toward the toes and uh, we found an area that's not um, that's not as uh, uh, malleable, you know, because these vessels are not fixed structures. Um, so we accessed with an 018 V18 wire. We placed a merit uh, pedal sheath, three French. Um, we have an 018 um, uh, spec catheter from Reflow Medical, uh, 90 centimeters. Um, and uh, actually through the needle, the, the wire uh, already went through the CTO cap under ultrasound guidance. It was actually a nice image because even through my access, I got subintimal in the DP as I'm getting access. So I wish you guys had that live, but it was running on the side, so we could see I, it actually. Oh, it was okay. Good. Yeah. So I was, uh, you know, if I was if I, if I was talking, I would show you how actually and very smoothly actually the wire was in the subintimal plane because these vessels are not much larger than the tip of a needle. Um, our interventional ultrasonographer Abby is uh, there from below. From an integrated access, I have a five French precision sheath from Truma. I have an O35 Navi Cross catheter, and I have a command wire. We looked with ultrasound, and the proximal CTO cap is concave, favorable to cross in an integrated fashion. So I'm taking my O35 Navi Cross catheter, I'm advancing it uh, over my 014 command wire, and uh, we're going to go as far as I think it's safe. Um, and here my wire is stopping. So I'm going to ask Abby to advance the wire. Go ahead, Abby. So advance from, the wire. Yeah, well, that's great. So, so from the panel, your approach, especially from retrograde, if you're planning to work anti-grade, would you still try to put a sheath in because your weight is still down? Would you do it like bare back sheathless, just micro puncture, I mean, micro catheter and wire? Any change in thought process? Advance the wire more. A lot of times when you have it. a sheath from below and you're able to floss, this gives you a lot Advanced of control when you're dealing with something that's super calcified where you can't get a balloon down there or you're having a hard time passing your, you know, atherectomy device. So um, a lot of time I like to like to floss, do the whole thing and then, you know, uh, externalize and try to do the pedal loop after that. Okay. Yeah, see, oh, that's, oh, that's beautiful. So we just uh, floss with our 018 wire, and now we're going to try to put a catheter in catheter. Sometimes it's a challenge. Let's try that, Abby. Yeah, so this, um, is, this is a great technique to marry those wires. So now you can uh, technically either floss it, externalize it, or work from the top if you have already have good access. Keep pushing it you more Abby flexibility. With the yeah, so keep that, pushing yeah, until tough. you run out. So now once we have uh, flossed, what we'll end up doing is we'll put an 014 wire and uh, we have a wire that's completely flossed through um, the anti-grade axis. I'll keep following you. All right, so this is an example of like, okay, the catheter is not going. Uh, the, ca the 018 catheter is not going inside the um, uh, 035 catheter. So watch what, I'm, what we're going to be doing now. So keep going, Abby with the wire as much as you can. Yeah, out of wire, okay. So let me follow you as far as I can. So this is, this is if, if, if we're troubleshooting, this is a good, um, good trick um, of what you can and cannot do. Take off your finger. That's a, yeah, that's an excellent presentation of how you're uh, playing in tandem, having an 035 and an oven system work as one unit and then trying to bring yeah. them down all the way. Okay, so now all I'm trying to do is take my um, Navi cross catheter as distal as possible. Now I know I crossed to the plane of the 018 catheter, so I am uh, pretty confident that uh, even if I remove my 018 wire, I can floss into the sheath. Happy, go ahead and remove the catheter, not the wire. Yep, keep going. Yep, go ahead, take it, take it out. And if you have more wire, go ahead and advance it. Yep, go ahead. So what we have right now is an 018 wire that's flossed through and through. And we're gonna, we're gonna work on making sure that we have an 014 wire. We're gonna take our command wire 
and floss it into the sheath, the marriage sheath that we have down there. Okay, give me... Uh, uh, that's right. So that's good. Yes. Remove it, Abby. So for the panel, what's your no. wire escalation uh, strategy? Strategy. I know we we want to start low so profile. May, may I just uh, may yes, I please. just say one one thing here that because uh, um, you were asking about having a sheath or not. If I did not have a sheath, um, you can remove the wire, Abby. If I did not have a sheath, I would not be able to do what I am going to do right now because there's nothing to tunnel into. So if I had my catheter bare and um, and the catheter would not tunnel into the O35 catheter uh then we just we just lost everything that we did so just 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 uh, one of the advantages of having a low profile sheath uh, in this patient sorry you, you can go ahead continue no, no that's a very important point i mean especially doing interventions and complex interventions like step this, away from radiation you don't want to be in the middle of a procedure and say oh i wish i could have done the other way so i completely agree with that point it was just to bring to the audience of what options people have and uh, how they can approach it. But this is also a great view to visualize, like you say, oh, you're right. So sorry, let, I wanna show you what happened right now. So you see the 014 wire, it went through my pedal sheath, right. see that? Yep. So now exactly. we're flossed through and through. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna secure our um, wire outside the foot. We're gonna start with IVIS. I don't know what the panel thoughts on performing IVIS. We perform IVIS 99% of the time. Rarely we don't perform IVIS because I think it's very important uh, because even though it seems like we cross very smooth, smoothly and easily, you can, um, I find that that's a very crude way of determining that if you cross in the true lumen or not, and really interferes in our decision in terms of what we need to do for this patient. So yeah. I'd be curious, what are the panel thoughts on IVUS? Dr. Wanti, can I have a so Actually, before we get to the IVUS, Fadi, I had a question for you. You know, with the fact that O35 Navicross, you know, was able to track down anti-grade with flossing, I think it behaved more as a softer or slash functional CTO. And in case, you know, you couldn't advance your Navicross, but what would your next strategy be? Yeah, so so the Navicross is, uh, it's made by Terumo, as we know. Uh, ring down, please. Um, it, it's a, it's a double-braided, um, hydrophilic-coated uh, catheter. And, uh, you know, the company doesn't like it when I say it, uh, but uh, it's really uh, acts as a CTO device. Um, it's very smooth. It can go through anything, including adventitial uh, tissue for those patients. So um, it, 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 it's, it, by itself, it's a separate category. It's different than any other O35 uh, catheter um, that, uh, that's out there on the market. Bookmark this, please. Um, so, so, uh, so, and as you can see on IVIS here, you can see this mixed plaque nature popliteal. Um, and, and so it's not like really that just soft. The patient presentation does not does not fit like you know with acute or subacute presentation. It's it's a typical you know I had the wound. It's not healing and they're not crashing and burning. So this is a distal pop AT. Yeah, you can see the calcification right there. Yeah, and this is the AT. I'm going slowly to see if we got subintimal in any area. Yeah, I think you'll look pretty good till here. So, I mean, there is some calcification, but there's like Bosco's talking about, it's probably a mixture of plaque and calcification right there. I mean, there's definitely areas of narrowing. But you look very well and through to the vessel. So that's a one millimeter legs. vessel. So, you know, you know, you know, like this is why I did not even mess with integrated access because I'm not, I'm, I'm not that good. I'm not going to be able to re-enter a one millimeter vessel distally. So... To me, it's a, based on the CTOP classification, this is a safer approach. Look at the positive and negative remodeling, guys, for this patient. So, yeah, I know it's true. So, and for the panel. We are all the way to the DP. Yeah. So, for the panel, how many would do IBIS or how many would say, I already know how it feels, how it does, I know my plan, I'm just going to do like one, two, and three? So Lisa, I, a three, so five by two, four. So, I think the, I think the, the importance here of IVIS is, is twofold. I mean, uh, obviously you want to know the path that you took, but you also know that you're kind of stuck with a couple modalities. And so you know that PT, you need to do the, as good a job as possible with your PTA, which means that you need to know the size of the vessel and eyeballing these things. You're always going to 
undersize. I mean, Fadi showed it right away when he got access in the DP that this vessel is much larger than it appears. So if you don't IVIS, you're going to undersize your balloon almost all the time, I think. Uh, anybody else? It's, all, it's also going to help you choose your aesthetic. So, down, so you know, based on how much calcium, how much mixed black, and so that's going to help you in uh, deciding your choice of aesthetic to me. Okay, great. So now we have the IVIS morphology, we have the sizing. Uh, what's the next thought process? Like, what is the treatment strategy now? Let's see for the panel. You have, you've seen it. You already know below the knee we have, we don't have as many options. We do have options, but, you know, still limited on the stenting zones and five by DCBs, five by no DCB, especially in the U.S. So what would be a next strategy? So now we've defined everything, the lay of the land. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Lee? What would you do next? Um, you know, maybe I'm a little old school, but, you know, there's still this Haven't unpredictability of balloon angioplasty below the knee, especially when you have a long lesion like this. Looking at this, there was definitely calcium, not as much as obviously we've seen. I think uh, I would probably choose some sort of laser, uh, some sort of atherectomy like uh, the newer lasers, or you can still use CSI. You asked about the uh, distal um, axis. One uh, of the advantages of having that Abby, is when I, if I'm spinning or doing an orbital oh. atherectomy, I leave that open, and it's, it's like a distal right embolic yeah. protection device, you know, so it washes it out. Um, you know, I didn't think you need thing. IVL, but okay. again, we have you know some tools that we can use here. Wait. Anybody else would use any other device? I mean, any other options? No, but I think I think Art brings up a really good point because this the IVIS information is 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 a little bit surprising. I thought we'd see more calcium, so right. I think you're absolutely right. This is one that a laser would work, but at first glance, you would think no, you'd think some some other device. So. Okay. Interesting. How, how about how about just plain old scoring balloon? Nowadays we have scoring balloons, chocolates, serenader. Serenader is doing a good job, like we were talking yesterday. Would anybody do straight up uh, scoring balloon and hoping for the good result? I mean, you could. There's no one's going to be able to tell you that that's wrong. Uh, all right, Doctor Fahri. Uh, oh, so you're trying to be, uh, treat the SFA first. <laughs> um. Well, the focus is going to be the distal popliteal and the um, and the AT. Uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of our focus. There's a couple of areas that already had recoil. Right. Um, I mean, compared to the length of the SFA and the popliteal TPT perineal, um, I would like to point out to everybody that we don't have. These patients are re not represented in any trial, period. Any randomized trial that you have out there, atherectomy, stenting, DCB, um, you know, below the knee, above the knee, these patients here, they're not represented in any randomized controlled trial. Right. So, um, you know, you, you have, that's why, you know, I'm, I'm always advocating for CLI centers and uh, and volumes because stop please let's go to the lowest settings because uh, to put it simply um, in 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 the it, nowadays uh, to just say balloon angioplasty not that anybody's suggesting that I think is is quite frankly uh, ineffective and we do have data actually that simple balloon angioplasty uh, might have some harm in 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 these instances. I mean, if you look at retrospective data from Medicare database, the CLI Global Society, the patients that did the worst were the balloon angioplasty arm, and it makes sense because you know you're not treating four to five centimeter lesions, you're treating maybe here 350 millimeters, uh, and if we do the pedal loop, you're talking about 500 millimeters. So simple balloon angioplasty is not. Uh, going to be ideal for both patients. Start Make, here, makes sense. Before we go on to the next lecture, just a quick question. What's your, like, what's your thought process on choosing an atherectomy device? I know you're choosing laser here. We have other options, directional, orbital, now also shockwave. So what made you choose this over the other? Can you discuss a little bit of your algorithm for the people? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So let me stop staying for a second. So, so basically, you know, IVIS is extremely helpful. Uh, again, I'm, I'm the first one to say, but anecdotally, if you look, I mean, it, for us, and when we're, a, uh, we have a large volume of our patients, our CLI, and particularly below the knee disease patients, they tend to have more mixed plaque. And by mixed plaque, I mean soft, intimal calcium, medial calcium, and adventitial calcium. So to me, um, 
IBIS and extravascular ultrasound, it's a, it's a much more sensitive way of defining plaque morphology um, and, and helping me choose. So we find ourselves uh, utilizing laser as a good tool, orbital atherectomy is a good tool. That's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is <clears throat> if you have multi-level disease, you want to use a single device. So, um, you know, there, there's excellent operators that would use, uh, you know, large device like uh, directional atherectomy or aspirational atherectomy with jet stream devices. But I don't think in this, in this particular case, directional atherectomy or jet stream atherectomy, those what I would call large bore devices would be ideal. They, they, might, they might be ideal for the inflow disease, but not necessarily for the outflow disease with the AT and the pedal loop. So that's kind of uh, uh, a quick, fast uh, way of uh, how I choose my devices. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, just listening to the to the lecture. So we, uh, after laser arthrectomy, we um, uh, ballooned, uh, uh, we ballooned uh, our SFA popliteal segments. Um, and you can see, despite having a 5-0 balloon in the uh, distal edge of a stent, uh, there is immediate recoil in that area that we IVUS in the popliteal segment. So uh, I'm thinking at this point, I'm going to place a stent in there because of the immediate recoil. Um, because despite high balloon inflation, high pressure balloon inflation, I'm not able to, uh, it's, it's just, it, it yields, but then it recoils downstream. Um, and then we proceeded with balloon angioplasty. I have a 3.5 by 240 jade balloon. Uh, that uh, I'm using, I, I use a lot of sequential balloon angioplasty. Do we have blood to, okay. So um, uh, remember we're not, we're not done here. I'm just gonna get a sense of, we're gonna move the balloon, uh, let, let it bleed a little bit, Abby. I'm gonna leave a balloon inside the body. So I usually will leave the balloon inside the body. I don't get rid of the pedal axis. Uh, is it still dripping? Right. So we're going to take a picture just to make sure that we don't have any perforations, any issues. Um, and what I would like to show you before we go off is how do we get into the pedal loop? All right. So we still have time. So, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Here you go. Ten so, yeah. So for the panel, so I know uh, like we were talking about balloon angioplasty, recoil, the patency rate being horrible. So in this case, after you've done an atherectomy, do you have a protocol? How long do you keep your balloons up? Is it like a minute, two minutes, three minutes, or is it just a random number? Nice. Looks gorgeous. Good job. Let's have a two five balloons then. Or um, when I was five. newer at this, I would keep it up for three to four minutes and okay. close it. <laughs> Uh, now I don't have the patience to be honest. So, so a minute and a half typically. There's no no protocol necessarily. Um, I think it just depends on how it inflates. You know, do you have waste things that yield? And uh, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Yeah, let's get the ultrasound ready. Awesome. Wait. So that yeah. that's your end. He is just Go going up slow, and um, I, I too probably are am, use about a minute and a half, half inflation. The, the point Go is, ahead. I guess yeah. it's not a. 20 second inflation and it's not a five minute inflation, but uh, guys okay, switch us to the ultrasound right. and using a balloon of appropriate size. Is the and I think nowadays we have those taper balloons, which also gives us a good advantage. We get a three or two, five approximately bigger because we know these vessels do taper down. So especially when you're doing longer lesions, I think these taper balloons also come in yeah. uh, handy. Uh, Let's have a Shein black ready. You know, but honestly, I don't open it. You're at the mercy of what the patient brings to the table. You know, if it's, the it's balloon is diabetic, up, so uh, back. and strange renal disease patients with a lot of intermal and medial calcification, you can keep a balloon up there for three minutes, and you take a picture 15 minutes later, which has been seen in some papers that is significant recall, and that's why with most people allude that uh, you know a threctomy or debulking or modifying the plaque is uh, critical to this. Right. So just to go back on the basics, I know we talked about pedal axis, anatomy, sheets. Do you have a cocktail regimen like we have in interventional cardiology and radial axis to keep the spasm away? What, we'll what regimen or what therapy do you use, George? I, I use a lot of the same stuff I would do for coronary. So I, I'll give nitro, I'll give nicardipine, <clears throat> but a lot of nitro. So sorry, I... I George, I'm, I apologize. I don't want to interrupt you. I just want to show you guys. So the, the EVIS ultrasound image, so this is going to be ultrasound guided crossing into the pedal loop. So to the left of the screen, you see the sheath being pulled. Uh, this is our wire. I'm going to pull it back. So I'm going to have our ultrasonographer pull the sheath. So go ahead, Abby, pull the sheath. Sheath is out. So now I'm going to, I'm going to use ultrasound. So, I mean, it went, it went smoothly here. 
but usually sometimes the wire will go through the exit, through the entry point, and you have to manipulate it a little bit. So, uh, so I'm past the access point, I'm into the foot. So you typically, once I secure that, uh, you can use a, you can use a, uh, Oh, and, and we're already we already into the arc with artery here, but uh, you can use an 018 uh, catheter to follow it. Uh, there are some good balloons out there to um, that have really low profile crossing PV balloons like the Jade, like the Ultraverse uh, balloons, like the Turumo balloons, the uh, uh, Cross Pero 014 platform. They're really excellent balloons. Um, so now this is the command wire. I'm going to switch from the command wire to a softer wire. I'm going to use the uh, either the Regalia wire or the Xi'an Black. Let me have the Xi'an Black, please. So sorry, you guys can continue. Carry oh, on. I mean, that's a great demonstration. So the idea now is to try to complete your pedal arch and uh, provide uh, complete uh, revascularization to the foot. So no, I was just talking, what is your protocol about getting the sheets and keeping the spasm away? So we're talking about how we do in uh, radial axis for interventional cardiology. You have a different protocol, a thought process, Fadi? Um, you know, we, uh, I'm sorry, was the question for me or yes. to, the, to the panel? No, well, for you, I guess. Uh, so so, so, so we, 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 we published the TAMI solution within the right. TAMI paper. Um, and uh, obviously that was not tested or randomized or anything like that. I will tell you, uh, even as a person that uh, talked originally about the TAMI solution in, uh, in the TAMI paper, um, right now in our outpatient CLI center space, uh, we don't use it. We use intermittent nitroglycerin. Uh, we haven't found a significant difference. I think if you have the capability to have a drip, the, the, the way this started is there was shortage, if you guys remember, with nitroglycerin right. a couple of years back. So we used like some calcium channel blockers and we stopped using the drip. So, and we haven't noticed a, a big difference um, for those patients. So I just use intermittent nitroglycerin. I don't know what the other panel uses. Yeah, I think in the 50 beginning, of nitro. again, I used to use a lot of Tammy solution or yeah, now that, frequently no. flush it. Nowadays, uh, you know, I don't really do much to it. I just make sure the ACT is over 250. Um, and if it's sitting there dormant for a long time, I'll just flush it. Flush the sheet. Yeah, I think that's a very good thought process. Yeah. Flushing the sheet and uh, uh, making sure your ACT is well. So you have now an 014 wire. There's a C on black. Yeah, this is a she on black. Um, so I'm looking, um, I'm looking at the loop. And uh, it looks to me that I have intact digital branches here, uh, superior and inferior digital branches. I'll, I'll take an oblique view to show the digital branch to the toe. Um, and, and look what I'm doing with my wire. I really, there is no force here. It, the wire has to sail very smoothly. Um, otherwise, I will not push it. Uh, so... Uh, basically, I'm just interrogating uh, uh, kind of uh, our CTO colleagues in the corner. What do you guys call it? Fishing? Or, uh, or uh, surfing. surfing. I don't know what the term for yeah. it. I don't do coronary CTOs. <laughs> surfing. Surfing. That's how we call it. Yes, 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 yes. Surfing. So I don't do coronary CTOs. That's why. So. All right, great. You yeah. think there's a so, CTO of that um, Peter Loop? Fadi, do you think this um, is a CTO? You know, already? I... I see, I don't see the lateral plantar artery. I see a branch of the lateral plantar artery. Well, I'm going to play it here. See that? Yeah. So you see the first digital branch, inferior digital branch, which is the area, which is the area that has uh, the wound. So if I can get to that, I think, I think I've achieved my objective for this patient. Um, so I'm going to Yeah, I agree with you, Fadi. I mean, I think go you've, down. Already, you've already helped this patient a lot, I'm sure. You know, when you uh, it's promising. So when you if you really want to open this arch, the uh, again, the two views are helpful and also sometimes injecting through the catheter like he did. At the same time you do a popliteal injection, it fills in more of the picture and you can see exactly, you know, more of the connection to the lateral plantar artery. Yeah, I think I mean by improving the inline flow, he's going to fix the pop the deal. He fixed the AT complete CTO. We do have some peroneal also giving the collaterals. So we're now pretty much down to a two vessel runoff, and uh, going to this interdigital artery will again uh, provide as much maximum benefit to the patient as well. Uh, so uh, by the time you fish, I think we can scoot in one more lecture unless you have something else for us. No, I'm going to go ahead and inflate here. Uh, okay, sometimes also this. when you get rid of uh, stenosis uh, proximally, 
Go ahead, Stan. One, two, three, four. Uh, one, sometimes when you get a, rid of a stenosis proximally, that opens uh, the area a little bit more. So uh, I might have uh, perforated the, the, the small branch that I was showing you earlier because uh, I got aggressive and that's how long it takes. I mean, just, uh, just a small push. What size so, balloon which, do you have? Which, uh, this is a two five millimeter balloon. Okay. Let's go up to four, uh, six. So, uh, you know, it was a rendezvous trial. It's a Japanese registry that looked at complete versus incomplete. There's other trials too, small trials, but basically showed um, along the lines of angiosome directed therapy that patients who are ambulatory and have a complete pedal loop, uh, their chance of wound healing is in between the 80 to 90% range. Uh, the patients with incomplete pedal loop, uh, they, their wound healing is in the 60% range. And the patients that had the worst outcomes were Vietnam ambulatory patients. Um, uh, but that's an Asian population, um, you know, it was in Japan. So um, it, there, was, there was a lot more trials looking at complete pedal loop for, for a lot of those patients. So uh, that's, that's why I, I advocate, uh, we try to advocate for it with our patients whenever we can, especially, I mean, obviously, if they have a wound, so. Oh, that's great. great. All right, so. Uh, Eight. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to move to our uh, next lecture. We'll have you on the side, so we'll just probably see an angiogram once you deflate the balloon and have a better anatomy. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, we, just, uh, we just found the pedal loop. I'm replaying it. Uh, you guys see that? Yeah. So that's the lateral plantar artery. I feel much more comfortable with that. Can I have a 2 by 240, uh, Lisa, if this doesn't go? And this is kind of a typical uh, form here. Uh, go ahead, Lisa, open it, please. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, uh, treat this here. Uh, and then we're going to take a 2O balloon. 2O um, balloon and to take it into the arcuate artery. I want to show you that this is the image that uh, we had in an, in an AP cranial view. Um, you can see the arc hint of the arcuate artery. You can see a hint of the lateral plantar artery. And this is the, the, the medial view showing the first digital branches. So, so what I'm going to do is here, um, do you have a 2O balloon ready? Yeah, okay, good. So what I'm going to do right now is going to take that 2O balloon in there and complete the pedal loop uh, in this patient. Um, and hopefully we'll be, we'll be done. Uh, doing complete revascularization. And this is what I mean. By the way, I, I, uh, Dr. Lee was describing about uh, sad and bad disease. We just published our case series, the largest in the U.S. as far as I know for uh, percutaneous DVA. Um, we just published it in the Journal of Sky, actually. And uh, the criteria that we depended on to diagnose patients with uh, um, sad disease, if, if you may say, was purely ultrasound, uh, by ultrasound. So if we identified a, a white stop sign in the plantar circulation, uh, obviously the patient failed, failed um, traditional arterial revascularization. Those patients were deemed to be uh, candidates for DVA. Um, and that's, that's how we went, uh, simply because of what Arthur said. I mean, just angiography is such a poor way of determining, I mean, this case was an example, right? When I did a selective an uh, angiogram yeah. with the catheter in the popliteal versus from the sheath, it's a big difference. No, um, so, uh, <clears throat> go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Pat. Uh, I was going to say, like, this is kind of a typical uh, uh, view when you're doing a pedal loop, kind of in an AP uh, uh, fashion. This is kind of a typical um, uh, pedal loop uh, that you see uh, in patients, kind of a, almost a figure eight in an AP view. Um, I, think, I think that's a great demonstration. Two by, by 240. Yeah, it's a great demonstration of how angiographic views are very necessary, like we talked about in the lectures as well, especially when we go down all the way to the pedal arch, defining the anatomy, trying to be in the branches and not end up in uh, no man's lands. So, I mean, a great demonstration of how to get... Uh, you know, identify your vessels. Uh, let me talk to the panel about management, let's say long-term management, follow-up wise, what do you do? What's your protocol? Dual antiplatelet therapy. I know we talked about, and we're probably gonna keep talking by, by the end of the day as well about your anticoagulation, antiplatelet, uh, medical management therapy. So let me start from the left all the way down. What's your, how do you follow up on these patients? And number two is your medical management or the future management after intervention. 
Sure. I think it's very important for us to own these patients once we start working on them. So um, I have a nurse practitioner see them within two weeks, uh, in addition to all their wound care follow-up, assuming they're a CLI patient. And then I see them monthly until they're healed. And um, I don't necessarily repeat phys uh, physiologic testing nice. on a standard basis, but um, I think just, uh, clinically following up is, is key. Um, as far as the medications go, um, for this patient, I'd be more inclined to use uh, probably Riva, uh, Roxaban, just in addition to antiplatelet therapy to uh, maintain patency through these. Bhaskar, how about you? Yeah, so usually I have uh, not received any kind of stenting, especially drug eluding. I go with uh, Plavix and Zeralto. I leave that on uh, for um, probably as long as I can, and then again repeat it within Down. two weeks. Down 12. Plavix. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I do a lot of uh, Zarelto and aspirin. Very rarely I'll do triple for a month, but usually I'll get them on the next day on the Zarelto. You know, load them with Plavix and aspirin before the procedure and then start Zarelto the next day. Um, and then clinically, you know, depending on the wound and location, but like for this kind of thing, I just use a handheld Doppler when I see them within the month. If I get a good signal, I'll see them typically almost every month, either me or my PA. Check the signal, check the signal. If there's any doubt, then I might repeat imaging. Um, that's beautiful. All right. What about her? I usually use DAPT. You know, before I talk about Riva, I have that conversation with the patient because although you're decreasing their, you know, the primary outcome, the trial of amputation, we do decrease their major bleeding. So, you know, I do have that conversation with the patient before committing them. I also want to comment, I think what Fatty did here is like a masterful demonstration of showing both views, lateral right. and anterior, like exactly what Arthur was trying to teach us. And I don't know, he didn't talk about it, but he actually crossed the CTO of the deep plantar too did it very masterfully and very uh, patiently. So I think that we have to go That's better right. for that. Yeah, I mean, my own feeling is if you open the plant arch like this, um, your patency, your runoff is probably better. The other thing that I would sometimes do is if there's extensive gangrene, I mean, you know that you're going to have to be back here. This, I would go straight up and open the posterior tibial because then you can sort of dual blood supply. And if one goes down, you have the other one that's still open, uh, especially if the CTO in the contralateral tibial might be shorter, you know, patency may be better, right. so... But here, you put a wire, you prolapse it, go up, and if it's not an anomalous, or maybe it is anomalous, but you go right up, it'll go right back into yeah. the uh, Yeah, my next question would have been, would anybody go for a PT intervention, this or stays, or just leave it, let the wound heal, and then decide? I think it's like almost now, what, an hour and a half in the procedure, I would stage it. You're tempted to keep going, but I think, I hope this would stay. Um, I would consider bringing him back and, and you know, open the AT anagrade retrograde, because otherwise it's going to end up being like a um, three-hour case. I'm just uh, happy that Dr. Halaby did not did not uh, <laughs> did not disappoint by saying that opinion. So I'm glad that uh, the time spent with us was was good time for Shetty. Yes, Shetty is there. Shetty, you have some some uh, some uh, people that uh, hate you here. So they're all saying hello. So um, so this is uh, these are the final images. I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you the final images because I think we're uh, out on time. I'm gonna stent that segment uh, that's recoiled uh, with a short uh, six O stent. Um, and, uh, and, uh, probably, uh, we'll see you guys for our next case. Perfect. Uh, awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed this demonstration here. So let me show you the final images and, um, and, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys, uh, uh the next case. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Papati. Just quick question. Your antiplatelet, uh, management therapy, Plavix, Aspirin, Geralto, uh, all three? So I am a big advocate of, uh, uh Voyager and uh, uh, a compass trial. So right now we uh, at least have the patient on a single antiplatelet agent. And if there is no contraindication, put them on the Rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams uh, uh, BID. That's kind of our default strategy now within the last 12 months or so. And uh, again, anecdotally, uh, I feel like it served us well. We actually don't even stop Rivaroxaban for procedures. Uh, heart calves or even PVIs. All right. I don't know if uh, some of our colleagues do that or not, but we, do, we don't even do that. So, All right, so let's see the final pictures, and then we'll have a very important uh, talk by Dr. Luxstein, I guess, uh, discussing about drug eluding stents. Oh, it's a beautiful demonstration. You can see the loop fill up. Uh, good AT. Flow. Thank you, guys. This is an injection from the sheath, by the way. That's good, yeah. So you're going to just pull your sheath Let's out, hold manual up. pressure. Is that what you do? 
are the people um, access? Here, this this patient, this patient, uh, the site is compressible based on our ultrasound protocol. Um, if a site is compressible and the vessel is superficial, we do actually manual. Otherwise, we can use other closure devices. But this case here, he's very superficial, so we're going to use manual compression. Awesome, great. All right, thank Let you, thank you, buddy. Please open the That's a great case. We'll see you back at 10:55.